Thank you so much. And thank you for the wonderful dinner that we just had. It was very interesting to hear uh, from the students a little bit about the life here at Thomas More. It's just a wonderful place. Um, the way in which we commonly think about the common good includes two elements that seem to be in tension. The first element is that the common good seems to have primacy over private advantage. Today's President's Day, in honor of George Washington's birthday, and Washington is honored particularly because he preferred the common good to his private wealth and tranquility and ambition. Taking on arduous military and political duties which drew him away from his beloved country estate, and then laying them down again when doing so seemed the best course for preserving the form of government of his country. To give primacy to the common good over one's own advantage is honorable and desirable, but it is also arduous. It requires self-transcendence, a stepping out of the confines of the private goods most immediately known to us through our sense powers to a more universal good known by reason. And we human beings long for this self-transcendence. We long to contribute to something greater than ourselves, a greater whole of which we are a part, and to have our own contribution confirmed by the recognition of others, by bond. <coughs> In atomized mass societies, we're familiar with the phenomenon of people becoming estranged from the common good. To lack the recognition of others and to feel that one is not contributing to the common good at all can lead to seeing one's own life as worthless. So this is the first element. Thank you so much. In the way we commonly think of the common good. It is honorable and excellent to give the common good primacy. And in relating to it, we are like parts of a whole. It seems that we are for the sake of the common good. But there is a second element to the way we commonly think about the common good. It seems to be in tension with that first element. And this comes from our experience of totalitarian regimes, which try to absorb everything into the state, where human beings were treated as mere parts of the state, the way a branch is a part of the vine, and where the tyrants who ruled them could kill innocent human beings with no more compunction than a vine dresser prunes a vine. One of the slogans of the National Socialist Party in Germany was Gemeinnutz geht vor Eigennutz. The common interest has precedence over individual interests. Clearly, this understanding of the common good in inverted commas is wrong. Human beings are not merely parts of the state. So the second element in the way we commonly think about the common good is, seems to be the opposite of the first element, namely that what is common is for the sake of individual persons. The state is for individual persons whose good it must serve. How can we do justice to both of these elements in the way we commonly think of the common good? How is this tension to be resolved? <clears throat> One attempt to resolve the tension was made by the philosopher Jacques Maritain. Maritain um, tried to solve this tension by employing a distinction between man as an individual and man as a person. As an individual, Maritain argues, man is a fragment of matter. He is a part of greater wholes, including the state, and as a part, he is ordered to the goods of those wholes, as every part is ordered to the good of its whole. As a person, however, Maritain says, man is a spiritual whole who transcends the entire created universe, and thus he is not subordinated to the common good of society, but rather the common good is subordinated to him. Quote from Maritain, 
It is to the perfect achievement of the person and of its supratemporal aspirations that society itself and its common good are subordinated as to the end of another order which transcends them. Society exists for each person and is subordinated to it. End quote. In the 1930s and 1940s, Maritain's solution became very popular and was commonly referred to as personalism. But the Maritain himself um, hardly uses that term. But in 1943, an attack on Maritain was published, or at least it was interpreted as an attack on Maritain, though Maritain has never mentioned in this attack. It's an explosively brilliant book called On the Primacy of the Common Good Against the Personalists by Charles de Koenig, who was a Belgian philosopher who taught in Canada, in Quebec. Um, my father, a good friend of Mr. Thompson's here, he first read this book when he was, he started reading it, when he was waiting for a flight in the airport, and he became so engrossed in the argument of the book that he became oblivious to his surroundings, and they called up his flight. It was boarding, but he didn't notice. And then they called him by name three times, he didn't notice it. <laughs> he ended up missing the flight. <laughs> Now, de Koenig certainly sympathized with Maritain's opposition to totalitarian oppression. In the foreword to On the Primacy of the Common Good, he writes, quote, Human society is made for man. Any political doctrine that ignores man's rational nature and consequently denies his dignity and liberty is vitiated at its root and subjects man to inhuman conditions. That is why one rightly opposes totalitarian doctrines in the name of the dignity of man." End quote. Nevertheless, he argued that this legitimate reaction against totalitarianism had led in the personalists to a misunderstanding of human dignity as something absolute, not dependent on a more universal good than the person. In this, de Koenig argues, the personalists had unwittingly adopted some of the anthropocentric premises of modern philosophy. Thus, de Koenig argued, the personalists actually shared some of the same errors as the totalitarians whom they wanted to oppose, especially the Marxist totalitarians in whom de Koenig sees kind of a culmination point of the development. My aim in this lecture is to expound an account of the common good following de Koenig as a guide and show how this account does justice to both of the elements that I mentioned at the beginning. Both the element in our thinking about the common good that it seems to have primacy of the private advantage <coughs> and the element that seems to show the opposite. De Koenig begins his discussion of the common good with a summary of St. Thomas's teaching on what the good is. Quote, The good is that which all things desire insofar as they desire their perfection. Thus the good has the note, the raison, the ratio, of final cause. Thus it is the first of causes and consequently diffusive of itself. End quote. To define the good as that which all desire is to define it as that which attracts and fulfills our desire. The things that attract our desire are, first of all, the objects of our natural abilities, the objects of our sense faculties, tasty food, which we just enjoyed, fragrant perfume, beautiful sounds, light and color, the limbs that carnal love embraces, as Augustine says. Um, all of these objects, and in addition to them, the objects of our spiritual faculties, such as truth, justice, and spiritual friendship, 
we also attract our will, our spiritual desire. In a secondary sense, what leads to those objects or follows on that attainment can also be called good. It's desirable because of them. We desire the activities whereby our abilities attain to their objects. So I can call the activity of tasting a cookie good, or of knowing the truth that activity is good, because the cookie is good and the truth is good. I can also call the habit that enables my faculty to act well good. Science is good because it enables me to know well. And in a tertiary sense, what is useful for attaining a good object is good. Even studying can be called good because it is useful for coming to knowledge. It's not always evident when you're a student. <laughs> Moreover, the delight or joy that results from attaining a good object can also be called good. Hence, the joy that I feel when I know the truth can be called good. But what is most good is the good object that I desire. Since the activity of obtaining it and the things useful for obtaining it are for its sake, and the delight that follows on obtaining it is clearly secondary to it. One would not choose to have the delight of knowledge without actually knowing something. Our natural abilities are actualized by attaining their objects, and we ourselves are actualized or perfected by such actualization. Desire, in the strict sense, follows on knowledge. The good attracts us when we know it. Romeo doesn't begin to desire Juliet until he sees her. But in an extended sense, we can call any intrinsic inclination to actualization or perfection desire. Thus, in a sense, all natural things since they have an intrinsic principle of motion, desire their actualization, their good. In fact, Aristotle even says that prime matter, which is not a thing, but a principle of a thing, desires form, because it has an intrinsic ordering to form. Form is what actualizes matter. As we ascend from inanimate to animate to sensitive to rational being, we see that the higher beings are inclined to more distinct objects, which at the same time they take more deeply into their interior. A rock has a certain inclination to other heavy objects, but these remain outside the rock. A plant is able to take nutrients into itself and transform them into its own substance. An animal can do that too, but an animal can also sense the qualities of something other as other. The animal can see something blue without itself turning blue. Finally, human beings can take in all of reality through universal knowledge. We can know things quite distinct and distant from ourselves, but by knowing them, we take them deep into our interior life. What a piece of work is man says Hamlet, how noble in reason, how infinite in faculties, in form and moving, how express and admirable, in action, how like an angel, in apprehension, how like a god. Man cannot be perfected merely by living the life of nutrition and growth or of sensual pleasure like a plant or an animal. Rather, man is perfected by actualizing the faculties most specific to his nature. And in a way, what is most specific to man as a rational animal is moral action, in which the passions and activities of the sensual part of the soul are guided and ennobled by reason. We eat and drink, as do the beasts. But when a man is perfected by the virtue of temperance, 
is eating and drinking takes on a spiritual character. Therefore, moral action can be called the purpose of man, his happiness. And yet, man is even nobler in the activity of reason itself, in understanding and science, and above all, in wisdom. He becomes like a god, doing an activity that is more than human. Thus, the end of man is twofold, a lower, more human happiness, the end of the active life, activity according to moral virtue, and a higher, more divine happiness, the end of the contemplative life, the contemplation of the truth. The active life is good in itself, but it is also necessary for the contemplative life. As long as our sensual passions are in turmoil, we are distracted and cannot come. Excluding Thomas More students, of course, that <laughs> have no problem with distraction. But other mortals. <laughs> Only when our passions have been ordered by moral virtue do we have the calm we need to contemplate the truth. The good that we attain in happiness brings us to completion, to perfection. It is our end. But this good has a twofold character. Primarily, it is the object obtained or attained by our activity. It is the truth that is our end. Secondarily, it is the activity whereby we attain our object, knowledge, contemplation. The two are, of course, linked. The object is perfective of us insofar as we attain to it by our activity. Nevertheless, it is the object that has priority. It is the end. As our end, the good is the final cause. The final cause is the cause of causes. That is, it causes the causality of all the other causes. The matter can only cause insofar as it is actualized by the form, and the form cannot come into the matter unless some agent pours it in or draws it out. But an agent cannot act unless there is some reason for action. And this reason is the end, the final cause. Therefore, the final, the last cause, is also the first cause. Consequently, De Conic writes, it is diffusive of itself. That is, the good pours itself out, it spreads itself to the things inclined towards it. In reaching the good, the things that are inclined to it become themselves good. The common good is a good that is common or universal precisely as a cause, as a final cause. A higher cause extends its causality to more effects. A higher and more perfect good diffuses its goodness, spreads its goodness out, to more beings. It is more communicable to many. The goodness of a private good, say a cookie, can only be really diffused to one single person. If I divide a cookie, then it becomes less. I give you half of it, and then I have just what's left over. Hence, it is called a singular good. It's a good of a singular person. Its goodness is divided and diminished when it is shared. But a higher good, truth, or peace, for example, can be communicated in its entirety to many without being diminished or divided. My knowledge of the truth does not diminish your knowledge. My sharing in the peace does not reduce the supply of peace. The more elevated good is more diffusive and communicable because it is more good. Its goodness is super abundant. Hence, De Konig argues, it is the better good of the singular. That is, 
the more elevated good, although in a way more distant from me, higher than me, is really more perfective of It communicates its goodness more deeply to my interior. The common good is not common by being a collection of private goods, such as a library. Right? A library, you might think of a library as a common good, but it's not really common because the way it's communicated is that I borrow one book, you borrow another book. The book that I borrow, you can't borrow. It's a collection of many private goods, each of which can only be communicated to one person. But a truly common good is a single good shared by many. To attain a common good is to attain it as a common good, as the good of a community which is formed by communion in that good. De Koenig illustrates this with the example of the household, the family. The good of the family, he says, is better than the singular good, not because all the members of the family find in it their singular good. The good of the family is better because for each of its individual members, it is also the good of the others. That means the common good of the family is not left merely as a useful good that helps each member of the family attain private goods such as food and warmth. Rather, it is loved precisely as a common good. In fact, the common good is what makes the domestic society, the family, to be a society. Formally speaking, the Koenig argues, I love the other members of my family because they are sharers with me in that good. The common good is not the good of the collective, taken as a sort of quasi-individual, super-individual, leviathan. In that case, the common good would not really be common. It would be the private good of the collective or of its leaders. And this is how de Koning distinguishes himself from the totalitarians. Individual members of society are not like organic parts of a body which have no good of their own. Rather, the common good is the good of each of the members of society. The error of the personalists is precisely that they assume this totalitarian notion of the common good as a collective good, an alien good, a good of somebody else. And they see the best goods of, the per of persons as purely personers, personal, singular goods. So they reverse the order of goods that the totalitarians established, but not the false understanding of the common good. On the contrary, de Koenig argues, a thing's own perfection, its own good, most perfective of itself, is found in the common good as common. The common good is not an alien good, not someone else's good. A person is not a part of a society in the same way that a branch is a part of a vine. The good of the vine belongs to the vine as a single substantial whole. The branch is not a full substance, it is being and goodness only as a part. Nevertheless, the relation of the singular to the common good does have an analogical similarity to the relation of part to whole. And de Koenig shows this uh, more clearly as he moves from a consideration of the common good in itself to a consideration of loving the De Koning begins his discussion of the love of the common good with natural love. The love that is not elicited by knowledge, but is rather an inclination put into things by the divine intelligence. De Koning distinguishes between four different levels of natural love for a thing's own perfection, and therefore four different levels of a thing's own perfection. The first level is the perfection of an individual as an individual substance. And this is the good that an animal seeks when it seeks nourishment for the conservation of its individual being. 
The second level is the good of a thing that belongs to it on account of its species. This is the good, for example, that animals seek in reproduction. Is this really a thing's own perfection? The good it seeks in reproduction? Is it not the perfection of another that it's seeking, maybe of its offspring? No, says the quote. The animal prefers naturally, that is to say, in virtue of the inclination which is in it by nature, ratio indita rebus ab arte divina, the good of the species to its singular good. Every singular naturally loves the good of its species more than its singular good. That is because the good of the species is a greater good for the singular than its singular good. Therefore, this is not a species which abstracts from individuals and desires its proper good against the natural desire of the individual. It is the singular itself which by nature desires the good of the species rather than its singular good." End quote. There's a, an excellent dissertation on the Iconic on the Common Good by Father Aquinas Gilbo, a Dominican, and he shows how it is at this level, the level of the good proper to something on account of its species, that the common goods of human societies are found. The good of the family and the good of the polity are ordered not merely to the survival and perfection of an individual, but to the survival of the human species, and in the polity the perfection of all the manifold potentialities of human life. Though, of course, the inclination to society in man is not a mere natural desire, but is a desire in accordance with nature, but elicited by knowledge. The third level of a thing's own good is the good that belongs to it on account of its genus. This is the good towards which equivocal agents, that is, the angels, when they communicate goodness to many species. And it is the good of intellectual substances as intellectual. As Father Gilbo argues, it is at this level, the level of the good that belongs to something on account of its genus, that we human beings seek the good of the contemplative life. The genus in question here is not the univocal genus animal, at the summit of which stands man, but rather the analogical quasi-genus of intelligent beings, of angel, angels and men, at the very bottom of which stands <coughs> man as an intelligent being, more or less, is able to attain to the great common good that is the order of the whole universe. The fourth level of a thing's own good is that which it has on account of the likeness that exists between an effect and its cause. Or a principle and that which is from a principle, the Koenig says, which is a slightly more general way of putting it. Every cause is a principle, a beginning, but not every principle is a cause. Quote, It is thus that God, a purely and simply universal good, is the proper good that all things desire naturally the highest and best good, and which confers on all things their entire being." End quote. Every perfection found in created things is a reflection of the perfection of God. The perfection that creatures have is a participation in God's perfection. To participate is to take part in something without removing a part. My reflection in a mirror participates in my appearance without removing my appearance from me. God does not have parts. He is entirely simple. But creatures share in him in an incomplete, that is, in a partial way. Therefore, De Koning can consider the love of creatures for the Creator as love of parts for a whole. Creatures are ordered to their creator the way parts are ordered to a whole. The perfection of each creature, 
The perfection that each creature desires consists in an ever greater likeness to the Creator. But this means that the perfection that they desire only ever exists in a secondary way in them. It exists fully only in God. Therefore, to love one's own perfection means to love God more than oneself. God is, as it were, my true self. De Konig next turns to the love of the common good that is elicited by knowledge. <clears throat> and here he sees the greatness of the common good even more clearly. While an animal has a natural inclination to the good of its species, the love elicited by its sense knowledge cannot reach that far. By elicited love, an animal seeks only singular, sensible goods. We human beings, however, by the love elicited by universal knowledge, are able explicitly to desire common goods, and ultimately the universal common good. To love the common good as a common good is not to order the common good to oneself, as one orders a private good, but rather to order oneself to the common good. The private good of a cookie is ordered to me. I love the cookie for my own sake. In a sense, I am the end of the cookie. Or of multiple cookies. <laughs> <laughs> and I love a superabundant, diffusive, and elevated good, which is thereby common. I order myself to that. De Koning argues that such a love of a more common good requires a more excellent virtue. Virtue is the quality that enables a thing to do its own work or proper activity well. In man, there are three different levels of virtue, monastic or ethical virtue, domestic or economic virtue, and political virtue. This corresponds to the threefold division of moral science made by Aristotle. Monastics or ethics, domestics or economics, and politics. Monastic, in this context, has nothing to do with monks or monasteries. It's derived from the Greek monos, meaning alone, solitary. Monastic virtues are the qualities that enable a man to do his proper activity as an individual well. For example, monastic courage is the quality that enables a man to defend his own person in a reasonable way against dangers. Not to be, dis, uh, to be dragged off track from pursuing the good by fear of dangers. Domestic virtues are the virtues that perfect a human being as a member of the household, the family. For example, domestic courage enables a man to defend the common good of his household well. The household is the society in which our initial education in virtue takes place. Our parents form us in monastic virtue as well as in domestic virtue. And this education in monastic and domestic virtue is a proximate potency for political virtue, which is the highest kind of human moral virtue. The family prepares us for political life, but it doesn't actually realize political life. Political virtues are the qualities that enable us to participate in the highest common good of the human active life, the common good of the polis, the chivitas, the polity. For example, political courage, or military courage, which is a potential part of political courage, enables a man to defend the common good of the polity as a common good, not merely because his own private good is included in it. Quote from the Comte. The courage of man as man, by which he defends the good of his person, does not suffice to defend the common good reasonably. That society is very corrupt, which cannot appeal to the love of the arduous common good, 
and to the higher courage of the citizen as citizen for the defense of this good, but, what, but which must present its good under the color of the good of the person." The common good of society is twofold. There is the intrinsic common good, the order that unifies society, making it to be a society. And then there's the extrinsic common good, which is the common good intended by the one who brings about the common good, the intrinsic common good, by his governance. The intrinsic common good of the polity is peace, the tranquility of order, as Augustine defines it, that results from justice and prudent governance. This peace is a thing of beauty in which the splendid virtues of citizens are brought into a harmonious unity, like a symphony of human life which imitates the beauty of heaven. As Socrates puts it in the Republic, no city can be happy which is not designed by artists who imitate the heavenly path. The extrinsic common good of the city is found in happiness. As Aristotle says, a city is founded for living well, that is, for acting according to moral virtue. Now, there's a difficulty here. Virtuous actions seem to be singular and not communicable to many. Lord Nelson's act of courage at the Battle of Trafalgar is his act, it's not my act. It seems not to be a common good. <coughs> The key here, as, as de Koning's friend Jacques de Montléon argues, um, is friendship. We enjoy the activities, the virtuous activities of our friends as our own goods. Above all, when we act together with them. But even when we simply contemplate our friends' actions. We see this very clearly in military or naval friendship. For example, Lord Nelson's friendship with his comrades in acts of supremely excellent naval courage made those acts of courage a common good. Common, most, first and most intensely to, Nord, to Lord Nelson and to his officers, to Collingwood and uh, Hardy and the rest of them, but then to all the sailors of the fleet who were inspired by Nelson's courage to be courageous themselves. And finally, in a sense, even to the whole kingdom of England, which by honoring Lord Nelson, in a way, made his actions their good. The intensity of that friendship in naval virtue is shown by the famous scene of Nelson's death, uh, where he lies dying between the decks of the victory and the flag captain, Captain Hardy, comes down periodically to tell him how the battle is going as he's bleeding out. And um, he says to Captain Hardy, kiss me, Hardy. And Hardy, the battle-worn warrior, kneels down and kisses Nelson on the cheek with tears running out of his eyes and so on. Uh, <laughs> you probably know the story. Um, today is President's Day, George Washington's decision not to uh, seize lifelong power, but to step down after two terms of, as president, was seen as an act of political virtue aimed at preserving the form of government that had been established in America. And that act of Washington was shared by his political friends. For example, by Alexander Hamilton, who drafted the speech for him, the designation speech. But it was shared also to some degree by all his compatriots united to him in civic friendship, not only at his time, but even afterwards in memory, in honoring the great men of a polity who make their virtuous activities our common goods. The purpose of polity cannot therefore be reduced to the protection of individual rights. Note in passing, De Koning writes, the important distinction to be made between subject of right and foundation of right. 
that moderns tend to confuse. The right is defined by law, and law by the common good. End quote. De Koning doesn't really develop this, but um, if you look at the great tradition of Roman and medieval jurisprudence, the primary sense of a right, jus in Latin, is an object of justice. The virtue of justice is the firm will to give to each their due. So an object of justice is what is due, the thing or action due to someone else. That is a right in the primary sense of jus. For example, a fair share of the spoils of battle are due to Achilles. They are his right. Um, but of course you can extend that notion of right analogically to rights in the sense in which we more commonly um, use the term subjective rights subjective rights are the moral power that I have over an objective right so Achilles for example the spoils are his right you can also say the moral power that Achilles has over these spoils are his right, in an extended sense. But the primary reality is the objective right, the thing that is due to him. And the subjective power over the thing, that is kind of a consequence of the thing being due to him. Um, and since objective rights are primary, Subjective rights are dependent on them, and they're dependent on the distribution of objective rights, which takes place uh, above all through law. This is what De Koning is, is referring to. The right is defined by law, meaning what is actually due to someone, that will be defined by various factors, um, possession and custom and so on, but above all by law. And law is an ordinance of reason for the common good. In other words, all rights are ultimately derived from an ordination to the common good. But in modern philosophy, this relationship is reversed. In John Locke, for example, subjective rights are the primary reality of politics and jurisprudence. And everything else is founded on that. These subjective rights, these moral powers, private liberties, um, become the end of, of political life. And therefore, the common good becomes, comes to be seen as an instrumental good, useful for the preservation of these private rights. Therefore, the privacy of the common good is denied in modern, modern political philosophy. A polity founded on the primacy of subjective rights will therefore lead to an erosion of love for the common good. This will have, the Koenig says, execrable practical consequences. Namely, when each orders the common good to his own private good, every member of society becomes a little tyrant. The tyrant is defined by ordering the common good to his private good. So such a society becomes as a single tyrant. Um, the activities of the moral virtues, the happiness of the vita activa, is not the ultimate end of human life. The common good of the polity, which belongs to us on account of our species, is subordinated to a higher common good that belongs to us on account of our quasi-genus of intellectual being, the common good of the contemplative life. And the perfect political society, that is the complete political society, is indirectly ordered to the contemplative life in the sense that it is the society which is able to give us a proximate potency for contemplation, as it were, through the moral virtues. In contemplation, however, we attain to the order of the entire universe, a more than human good. This order is the primary good intended by God in the universe. God creates creatures to manifest his own infinite goodness 
through their beauty. Each creature reflects something of the divine beauty, but the greatest reflection of the divine beauty is the splendid harmony of the whole of creation, in which the manifold perfections of creatures are united by a hierarchical order of priority and governance. Quote now from St. Thomas Aquinas, the Deconi quotes this passage. For the goodness which exists in God in a simple and uniform manner exists in a multiple and divided manner in creatures. That is why the entire universe participates more in the divine goodness and manifests it more perfectly than any other creature. But the contemplative life does not rest ultimately in contemplating the order that is the intrinsic common good of the Rather, it reaches beyond it to the universal, extrinsic common good, who is God himself, the unbounded ocean of actuality, perfection, and goodness, the agent, exemplar, and final cause of all goodness. The highest natural perfection is the philosophical contemplation of God. But there is an even higher mode of participating in this highest common good. Through supernatural adoption, we are admitted into a share of the innermost life of God, where in the unspeakable happiness of the Trinitarian life, God's infinite perfection is known, expressed, loved, and given between three persons who are each the one God. This sharing in God's own life is the common good of the heavenly city, the heavenly Jerusalem. But this life begins already here below through grace. The church is the society that is already sharing to various degrees in the supernatural common good. This common good is the absolutely final common good. All other goods are only left rightly when they are directed to this good. Sin, in fact, simply is desiring all goods as private goods, directing them to myself rather than myself to the common good, or it is loving a less universal common good more than the most universal common good. Hence, the common goods of earthly polities must be directed to the most final common good. Quote from the quote. Man cannot be subordinated to the good of political society alone. He should order himself to the good of the perfectly universal whole, to which every lower common good should be expressly ordered. The common good of political society should be expressly ordered to God, both by the chief citizen and by the citizen who is a part, each in his own way. The common good requires of itself this ordination. Without this express or public ordination, society degenerates into the state, frozen and enclosed in itself. End quote. And another quote from the Iconic, different part of the same book. Is not society corrupted at its very root when those who have charge of the common good do not order it explicitly to God? If a politician ought to possess all the moral virtues as well as prudence, is it not because he is at the head and he ought to judge and order all things to the common good of political society and that to God? Isn't it for this reason that according to Cajetan and John of St. Thomas, the legal justice of the prince is more perfect than the virtue of religion? The proper direction of the political common good to God is accomplished by rulers recognizing the church as a more universal, perfect society than their polities. Um, and here I give you a rather long quote, but it's worth quoting at length. This is from the end of book one of St. Thomas's on kingship. I don't know if you've read that. Um, you may be familiar with it, but it's good to reflect on it. So this is St. Thomas. 
Through virtuous living, man is further ordained to a higher end, which consists in the enjoyment of God. Consequently, since society must have the same end as the individual man, it is not the ultimate end of an assembled multitude to live virtuously, but through virtuous living to attain to the possession of God. If this end could be attained by the power of human nature, then the duty of a king would have to include the direction of men to it. Now the higher the end to which a government is ordained, the loftier that government is. Indeed, we always find that the one to whom it pertains to achieve the final end commands those who execute the things that are ordained to that end. For example, the captain whose business is to regulate navigation tells the shipbuilder what kind of ship he must construct to be suitable for navigation. But, because a man does not attain his end, which is the possession of God by human power, but by divine. Therefore, the task of leading him to that last end does not pertain to human, but to divine government. Consequently, government of this kind pertains to that king who is not only a man, but also God, namely our Lord Jesus Christ. Hence, a royal priesthood is derived from him. And what is more, all those who believe in Christ, insofar as they are his members, are called kings and priests. Thus, in order that spiritual things might be distinguished from earthly things, the ministry of this kingdom has been entrusted not to earthly kings, but to priests, and most of all, to the chief priest, the successor of St. Peter, the vicar of Christ, the Roman pontiff. To him all the kings of Christendom are to be subject, as to our Lord Jesus Christ himself. For those to whom pertains the care of intermediate ends should be subject to him to whom pertains the care of the ultimate end and be directed by his rule. Thus, uh, St. Thomas, the end of Book 1 on kingship. And this teaching on the relation of political authority to ecclesial authority which follows from the teleological order of common goods, was defined ex cathedra by Pope Boniface VIII in the Bolunam Sancta. In conclusion, we can see how the Koenig's account does indeed do justice to both elements of our common experience of the common good. The common good is indeed more important than private advantage. To love the common good requires a more excellent virtue than the love of private goods. And therefore such love is rightly honored. And such virtue is desirable for us, since it is in the common good that we find our perfection. In relating to the common good, we do indeed relate to it as parts to a whole. And yet the common good is the good of those who share it. It can only be rightly pursued if it is pursued as the good of, in which persons share. Human persons cannot be, reduced, cannot be reduced to mere parts, like the parts of a vine. Rather, human persons have a great dignity, because they are able to share in great common goods, and ultimately the greatest and most common of all goods to which all other common goods are worthy.